you all to the first of what we hope will be an occasional series of special events by Diane Winston's Center on Religion and the Media, which of course has close resonance with the uh, School of Religion and with other programs on campus and around uh, Los Angeles. But we are particularly excited because Diane is the first person to hold a chair in, um, in media and journalism, we think any place in the country. It's a very, very important host and she's doing wonderful things here, but this series of talks will be particularly important. And then secondly, I'm pleased, although Diane will be introducing him to just say a special personal word of welcome to David Domke, who's gonna be our speaker today, both because David shares many uh, friends in common with many of us in the room, including my friend Ted Van Dyke, who had first suggested that he talk here and who's a graduate of and involved with his program at the University of Washington uh, but also because, David, the topic that, you, that you've uh, been working on for these last several years is so important today, so much in the news, and I will be a shill for your book here, God Willing, which is for sale um, after the program today, and I hope that many of you will be interested uh, in, in purchasing this book. Uh, David's much in the news talking about this topic, uh, and I must say it's a topic which not only is President Bush uh, is, is not only relevant to, to President Bush's rhetoric these days, but in the last day, and of course in the last weeks, but particularly in the last day or so, it's become a very much a part of the rhetoric of uh, Senator uh, Kerry. So, important topic, interesting time, wonderful center. Congratulations to you on this book, and to you, Diane, on launching this wonderful series. Diane Winston. Don't applaud yet because I have to see if I can actually hold the microphone, read my notes, and put on my glasses. Can you, can you hear me without the mic? Okay. Was religion always so deeply implicated in American politics? Well, there were a lot of voters who didn't want to support Thomas Jefferson because they didn't like his brand of religion. There were others who didn't want to vote for Lincoln because he didn't go to church enough. There was Woodrow Wilson who wanted to spread his idea of Christian mission around the globe. And of course, there was President Eisenhower who gave what my favorite quote is on the topic. He said, our government has no sense unless it is based in a firmly held religious faith and I don't care what it is. But what we're seeing now is this quantitatively and qualitatively different. Now it's not exactly new. The conservative religious movement has been building for at least 20 years. And a constellation of forces, um, including new technologies, media conglomerations, the fall of communism and the rise of political Islam has conspired to give it a political platform that perhaps its fathers, Richard Vigory, Ed McAteer, and Paul Weyrich probably never dreamed of. Moreover, the politicization of the conservative religious movement has spurred others to think of themselves as political religious blocs, most noticeably white Catholics and what we're beginning to see now, which is the progressive mainliners. This is also, as, as Jeff alluded to, convinced politicians they need to take religion responsibly and as he mentioned, we saw that just this weekend with John Kerry's speech. Last but not least comes the press, and you've noticed, as I have, the last week or so, there's been a slew of articles about religion and politics in the media. Ron Suskin had a very intriguing piece in the New York Times Magazine section last weekend, and that's been followed by a lot of blogging and a lot of local newspapers doing their own versions of the story. We could not ask for a better guide through this thicket than David Domke. David is a professor of communications at the University of Washington, and he's a former reporter who worked at the Orange County Register and at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. His interest is in how political leaders strategically shape public discourse, the way the news media reports on politics, and the implications for American public opinion and democracy. Although David was not interested in religion to start with, the more he listened to George Bush, the more he became convinced that he had to pay careful attention to what Bush was saying about faith. 
what Domke heard and studied and wrote about for the next several years resulted in the book that Jeff and now I will show for, God Willing, Political Fundamentalism in the White House, The War on Terror, and The Echoing Press. Reviewers call this book engaging and provocative, and I recommend it to you as an excellent study of the religion and political nexus linkage that's going to be with us, whether or not Bush wins again. I think that we are seeing a, a real change in the way Americans understand faith in the public square that's going to last probably most of our lifetimes. With that, I give you David Domke, and I hope you will enjoy him as much as everyone else who has heard him today has. Thank you. Did you have some, did you have some water? Did you have a water? Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today and to speak with you here at the Annenberg Program. The work that has come out of the faculty here and the students that have come here and come out of here and have come up to work with us have been a real pleasure and informative upon my work that I'm going to present for you today. So there is a tie to the Annenberg Program here today, both in the scholarship that I draw upon and in the people that are work, have worked with me on this project. So to come and speak with you is a real pleasure for me tonight. <clears throat> I've lost my voice a little bit today. It'll come back as I go because I'll get excited about what I'm talking about. So um, please just give me a moment to get warmed up. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Diane. Here's where I want to start with a quote from John Kennedy in 1960. Kennedy, of course, was viewed by white evangelical Protestants, particularly conservatives, as uh, they were afraid of him and the Pope taking over the White House. So he went in Houston, went to Houston in 1960 to convince them otherwise. And this is what he said. He said, I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act, and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote, <clears throat> where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference, and where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. John Kennedy in 1960. If you look at that statement there and you basically kind of move through it looking at the, the semicolons, everything that hits a semicolon is now present in the American political system. The separation of church and state is far from absolute. Catholic prelates are regularly telling politicians how to act, as well as voters how to act. Protestant ministers are regularly telling parishioners how to vote. Church and church schools are granted public funds. And certainly, I want to suggest, in one week, one man will be denied political office, and it's going to have something to do with religion, okay, in America. So how did we get here? How did we get to this place this time? Um, or how did we get back to here, is my question. My book today, the book that I want to present to you and talk about begins with crisis, with political crisis. And I want to offer two kind of parallel arguments to you. One is about the Bush administration and their rhetoric, and one is about the press and their response to that rhetoric. I have uh, examined both of them closely for the last few years and have been fortunate to develop some conclusions and some thoughts upon this. I want to present some arguments to you, some data, a little bit of evidence, and some conclusions, and then open this up for conversation. Crisis. We have to start here because crisis is seemingly an uh, omnipresent part of the American political system today. Whether it's the Clinton-Lewinsky scandal, the 2000 election crisis, the 9-11 crisis, or Iraq war, crisis seems to be happening all the time. And my argument, and not just mine but many scholars, is that presidential administrations capitalize in times of crisis. You don't have to be cynical about American politics to believe that in times of crisis, political leaders use it to their advantage. They push agendas. Uh, because the crisis gives them an audience and a context to do it. Three things in particular work to political leaders' advantage in times of crisis. The first is that the public rallies in support for the president. The second is that the news media defer to government officials. And the third is that a political leader has the opportunity to go public. And by this, scholars mean the ability to, uh, to sidestep news media and to go directly to the public with national addresses. Presidents like to do this because then their message isn't filtered by those bad journalists, okay? So they like to go around that. No president has had more of these lined up for him than this president. All of these lined up for George W. Bush after 9-11, and they capitalized the Bush administration. As a scholar of political communication, I spent my first year looking at the Bush administration after 9-11, not arguing anything about religion, 
just looking at these factors and how they lined up for the Bush administration and how they capitalized. This is the process that lined up to their advantage. They also took advantage with certain kinds of content. They emphasized national identity language, making Americans feel good about themselves. Newsweek had a well-known cover, Why Do They Hate Us? After George Bush had a succinct response, they hate us because of our freedoms. That has been his position. Of course, that's a national identity affirming statement. Our freedoms are great. That's why they hate us. It's not because of anything else. He affirms our sense of Americanness. Moral politics is a phrase that George Lakoff, a cognitive linguist at Berkeley, has talked about the ability to ratchet up one's moral language um, to utilize to your political advantage. So to take a claim and to put it in such morally powerful terms that you gain the higher ground morally in our culture. His subtitle of this book, the, the book is titled Moral Politics, and the subtitle is What Conservatives Know and Liberals Don't. And he's argued that the conservatives for the last three decades in America have developed a moral language that is more powerful than the one liberals have. And I think we see that quite clearly with George W. Bush after 9-11, in which he used the words evil, the word evil or evildoers to his advantage to, to make a, uh, claims about the, the kind of political terrain in which we live in. No, in my conception, no, no words have had a greater impact on the American political or global political process since 9-11 than those words, evil and evildoers, because they set us down a certain road in terms of policies. So here we go. This is George Bush after 9-11. He's got the process. Everything's lining up for him. And he's got the content. Everything pulling together. And so for <clears throat> almost a year, I didn't think religion was playing any role here. I had heard the president use religious language, quoting Psalm 23 on the night of September 11th, and using religious language at other times. But I didn't think it was any different until the 2003 State of the Union address. And in this address, in the final two minutes, in a clip I'll show you here momentarily, he pulled together the national identity language. He pulled together the moral politics language, and he fused it in a way with a, uh, a religious worldview that I think has taken us down a road that we haven't seen in the modern presidency. And I want to show you this clip because it captures it better than me just saying it. Many challenges abroad and at home have arrived in a single season. In two years, America has gone from a sense of invulnerability to an awareness of peril. From bitter division to small matters, to calm unity and great causes. And we go forward with confidence because this call of history has come to the right country. Americans are a resolute people who have risen to every test of our time. Adversity has revealed the character of our country to the world and to ourselves. America is a strong nation and honorable in the use of our strength. We exercise power without conquest, and we sacrifice for the liberty of strangers. <clears throat> Americans are a free people who know that freedom is the right of every person and the future of every nation. The liberty we prize is not America's gift to the world. It is God's gift to humanity. We Americans have faith in ourselves, but not in ourselves alone. We do not, know, not, we do not claim to know all the ways of providence, yet we can trust in them, placing our confidence in the loving God behind all of life and all of history. May he guide us now, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. I was intrigued by two things there. And I was watching this on my couch in my home, and I remember sitting up and saying, I don't think I've ever heard that before from a president. But I was intrigued by the, f the two things, and I'll work backwards. The first one is how he concluded his address. He said, may God continue to bless the United States of America. 
No president has ever concluded an address with that language. They've always concluded it with, may God bless America. And that's a subtle but important difference that matters to religious conservatives in this country, that rhetorical shift. The second thing was, of course, his claim that freedom and liberty are God's gift to humanity. So I was intrigued. Is this a standard language of the presidency? Is this something that presidents regularly do? Because they clearly use God language, and they clearly talk about freedom and liberty, which is the predominant value of the presidency. Have they fused them in this way? So I had a graduate student who was very interested in this topic, and he wrote a master's thesis upon it. His name is Kevin Coe. So this is the Coe data. And he went back and he looked at freedom and liberty, at claims of freedom and liberty as God-given in all inaugurals and State of the Unions from 1933 to 2004. So these are all the addresses that presidents have in common. He was looking specifically for these kinds of claims. Have presidents made these kinds of claims before? And what he found was that Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, in five of their 12 addresses that he examined, did include such a claim, freedom and liberty as God-given. When you took all the rest of the presidents, four of 61 addresses included such a claim. That's a six-fold increase, a quantitatively substantial increase that separate Reagan and Bush from everybody else. And so you begin, of course, to wonder what's going on here. So I wanted to know what was going on here. So I began to look closely at these addresses and the president's communications more generally, and as well as the entire administration's communications in the Bush administration. At the same time, I began to read scholarship that people in academia and also theologians had written about religious worldviews the kind of views of the world that accompany different religious traditions and faiths. I wanted to understand these. So I was interested in worldviews of religion and the actual political rhetoric of political leaders, uh, of administration leaders. And then the press came along too, and I'll talk about that momentarily. <clears throat> so here's the quantitative increase, but that's not the whole story. In fact, it's only part of the story. Because when you look at those nine instances of claims of God-given as freedom and liberty as God-given, five by Reagan and Bush, four by the other presidents, you see something quite important. When you look at the four of the other presidents, and these are by FDR, by Eisenhower, and a couple others, they have all spoken from what I call the petitioner position. They have spoken as if they're speaking to God as a petitioner of God, somebody who is talking to God, as if talking to a higher power, and is speaking to that God and asking for favor saying, please bless this nation. Please bring wisdom to this nation. Please guide us. When Reagan and Bush have spoken, they have not spoken the same way. Reagan and Bush speak declaratively about what God wants. In their communications, they have spoken as if they're speaking not to God, not about God, but as if they're speaking for God. That's the prophetic stance. To be clear, I'm not calling George W. Bush a prophet. What I'm saying here is that he has positioned himself as a prophet of God in the way that he speaks about what this higher power wants. It's an important rhetorical stance because accompanying this position of a prophet is an unwillingness to hear other viewpoints, an unwillingness to be challenged, and this absolute confidence that your way is right. Okay? That intrigues me. Over time, I became convinced that what was happening with this administration was a convergence of a religious fundamentalist worldview with a strategic agenda, <clears throat> bringing together a conservative Christian understanding, view of the, uh, understanding of the world, but merging that with the, the incredible, um, sophisticated strategic mechanisms of this administration, led by Karl Rove. It is, the, on the strategic side, the neoconservative political agenda, pursuing certain foreign policy goals, merged with a religious language that makes it attractive to large numbers of Americans. Neoconservatives have a language of empire. It's not an attractive language to many Americans, and certainly not globally. This religious language that the president brought into this equation is attractive, at least domestically, to a, a decent chunk of Americans. It was this fusion, this merger, that I call, in the book, political fundamentalism. It is not religious fundamentalism solely. It is the using of a religious fundamentalist worldview for political gain. It is the faith in the service of an agenda. This administration has brought political fundamentalism into an ascendancy in America. They didn't create it. I'll be happy to talk and question and answer afterwards. It has a history. The Reagan administration was quite good at this. But on several measures, the Bush administration has gained greater power through the usage of this than the Reagan administration ever dreamed of. What we have is political fundamentalism in ascendancy in America. And my question as a scholar is, 
Was this fundamentalism that was seen in the president's language, was it present across administration communications widely? So I looked at John Ashcroft's communications. I looked at Colin Powell's communications. I looked at Donald Rumsfeld's communications. I looked across a range of policies. I wanted to know, could we find this across the administration? Accompanying this, I had the question about the press. What about the mainstream media? As a former journalist, I'm the head of journalism in the Department of Communication up at Washington. I'm interested in the role, the democratic role that the press plays in America. What about the press? Well, I've started to call, taken to calling the mainstream media the echoing press because they consistently amplify the messages of political leaders without much critical analysis of these. Let me explain. The news norm of objectivity and neutrality that's present among mainstream media leaves journalists open to rhetorical manipulation. The inability to challenge the messages of political leaders because of the stance of objectivity or neutrality leaves journalists always uh, easily used by a sophisticated political, strategic political machinery. If you can put forward your message successfully by the political leadership, then the press will come along. And what will happen is the mainstream media will echo those messages. And so an echoing press is a press that is, uh, attempts to be objective and neutral, but in so doing, which I think are valuable goals, but it's the weakness, because in so doing, they give voice without critical analysis of these messages. We've seen this most clearly in this campaign with the Swift Boat veterans' claims. In buying advertisements and then getting their message widely covered in the news media, on cable as well as newspapers, the Swift Boat veterans' critique of Kerry was echoed widely without, any criti without much critical analysis. This echoing effect occurs most successfully if political leadership can stay consistent in their message. The Bush administration are masters at staying consistent in their message. Remarkably so. You can, you can look at the Bush administration and you can read something George Bush said six months ago, perhaps nine months ago, perhaps in 2001. And he says the same thing today. He says the same thing, and they recognize that that has effects to their advantage upon the American political system. When you add crisis, as we have with 9-11, and you add media conglomeration in the reality we have fewer diverse voices out there, this increases the echo also. Before George Bush ran for office, somebody told me who had covered George Bush in, in, in uh, Texas as, when he was governor had said he's the luckiest politician ever. This is before he ran for office, for presidency. Now, no one would ever want 9-11, but in terms of everything lining up for this presidency, everything has lined up for this presidency, and they've been strategically uh, sophisticated in what they've done. My question for the press was, but was are the, have the Bush administration messages been amplified across 20 newspapers and three broadcast networks? So working with graduate students, I examined 20 leading newspapers in this country and three television networks, evening newscasts, to see if the Bush administration's messages were consistently picked up, amplified across those messages. To be clear, my argument about the echoing press is not that the press is never critical of the administration. The press is. And when you look at the lead up to Iraq, there's several instances when the press in my data challenges the administration's policies. My interest is, does the press, even in that criticism, and certainly in the positive treatment of the, press, of the administration, pick up the language and the messages of the administration and echo them? Do they give them voice? Do they consistently do this? And my belief is, as a, as a communication scholar and as a former journalist, is that in echoing the messages of the administration, even if they're critical, they serve the purposes of the administration. Because those messages set the parameters of discourse around which the policies are created. So the policies come on top of the foundation of the rhetoric. They don't precede the rhetoric. So to win the war politically, the pol I should use a different metaphor, I'm sorry. To be successful politically in this country, you need to uh, be the one who lays down the foundation of discourses around which the policies are even debated. So the echoing press is a question about is the language adopted by the administration, not whether or not they ever disagree with the policies. I believe firmly that this administration will happily tolerate criticism from the press as long as their messages get covered, amplified in the press, okay? <clears throat> so, 
you know, the problem with being a, uh, someone who studies this stuff is when you get, a, you get an idea and you get interested, you just, you, you kind of work on it nonstop for the <laughs> next six months. So I worked on this nonstop for <laughs> the following six months after getting these ideas and I had a group of people working with me. It was an exciting time. And I examined the press and the administration for, for 20 months um, of analysis from 9-11 through May 1st, 2003. The reason I concluded in May 1st, 2003 is because that's when the president went on the aircraft carrier and declared a mission accomplished in Iraq. It seemed like a good bookend point for this analysis. In this 20 months period, we had a remarkable set of policies enacted by this administration. I won't go into depth about all the texts that I look at, but I looked at hundreds of administration communications across different actors, and I looked at thousands of news stories. This analysis has considerable depth to it. Um, more depth than perhaps was necessary, <laughs> necessary because the messages continue to resound across them. So let me present, having laid out the conceptual framework here, some of the evidence. I want to suggest to you that there are four characteristics in the Bush administration's religious uh, political fundamentalism. Characteristic number one are binary conceptions. Binaries are a rigid form of thinking and language that parses people, behaviors, and ideologies into opposing camps. It draws lines between people and says, you're in this group and you're in this group. And we're the ones that decide that. In the fundamentalist worldview, this is a core aspect because it simplifies the environment and limits our range of options. It's, this is the way in which lines are drawn between the pure and the impure. And in times of crisis, this is so attractive, not just to people who are religiously conservative, but to the public more broadly. This administration, in their political fundamentalism, has used consistent binary rhetoric about the political landscape in the US and globally. We know this. On the night of September 20th, nine days after the terrorist attacks, without any discussion with anybody outside of the administration, the president stood before the nation, before 82 million Americans, and said that nations of the world faced a choice. They either were either with us or with the terrorists. That's an either or binary. You're either with us or against us. There is nothing else possible. Now, upon that Bush doctrine, they have utilized two core binaries, good versus evil, and as I'll show you in a moment, security versus peril. One way to analyze the presence of these, because ultimately I'm a social scientist. I want to see data behind my thoughts, my, my ideas. I want to see if this is really going on. There's been a tremendous amount written about the Bush, uh, about George W. Bush's faith, but it's done from a biographical or anecdotal way. Nobody has systematically analyzed how it plays out in this administration. That's what I wanted to do. So one way you can look at with the presence of binaries for the administration is look at all those presidential national addresses. He gave 15 national addresses in 20 months, a remarkable period, remarkable press, uh, number. So I took all 15 of those national addresses and coded for whether or not he was using the ideas of good and evil. A simple approach to this is simply to code for the presence in each paragraph of whether the idea of good is there or the idea of evil. And then to see if those percentages essentially move together over time. Because if you're talking in binaries, then the amount of emphasis upon good should be parallel to the amount of emphasis on evil. They should move over time together. And when we map out the president's good and evil language, you can see how clearly good and evil in the president's national addresses move. These first three are three before 9-11. Here's 9-11 spiking together, and they move as if they were in some remarkable level of synchronicity. This is binary rhetoric. Now, the pink is, is the uh, emphasis on evil. So you'll notice the blue, the good emphasis, has a greater emphasis. You can't be the American president and talk about evil more than good on a regular basis. Wouldn't be tolerated. So you've got to talk about good all the time, or at least more than evil. But they move together so clearly. The only time the president emphasizes evil more than good in the binary is this speech right here, which is October 7, 2002, which is the first time he talked about Iraq. That's political fundamentalism. You're using the binary generally, and you flip the side of the binary that works to your advantage when you have an argument to make. He's making the argument that Saddam Hussein is evil. Thus, let's emphasize that as we move towards Iraq. 
A second binary that's present for this president is the security versus peril binary. This one gets le is less obvious, it's less religiously obvious. I, I don't think it's distinctly religious in the way good versus evil is, but it fits the worldview. Security versus peril is the way in which this administration envisions the world. Imagine those two concepts. We have security and we might experience some kind of peril. Many people on this planet, perhaps even most, experience both of those on a regular basis. They live in some sense of security, some sense of peril. This is an administration which refuses to live in that reality, that will not conceive of the world as some security, some peril. Instead, they present these two as a zero-sum game in which we can have enough security to not have peril. Well, that's a worldview that when you believe this, prompts you to have to remove any peril. You must begin to remove anything that's perceived as peril. So Iraq, for this administration, was seen as a perilous entity, must be removed. So we can do this analysis again with security versus peril. And we can see these moving together. Here's 9-11, the next address is at the National Cathedral. You know, you shouldn't talk about security peril too much at the National Cathedral. But then as you move this way, you see them move together consistently over time. Peril getting less emphasis until we make them move towards Iraq. And at that time, peril becomes the dominant side of the binary. It's a binary still, but uh, peril's getting greater emphasis. This is political fundamentalism for the administration. It's the merger of the religious worldview with the political strategy. Now what about the press? <clears throat> I'll show you a variety of, of data pieces about the press. Here I'll show you some editorials. I looked at these uh, 20, 20 newspapers, looked at more than 300 editorials to see if they picked up this language. Did they pick it up and give it voice? The ideas of good, the ideas of evil, security and peril. And I want to present to you a graph that shows you before 9-11, after 9-11 for each of these emphases, good, evil, security and peril. Here's good, not a great deal of increase after 9-11. Evil, a significant increase in the, news, in the editorials. Security, a large increase, peril, a great increase after 9-11. These three discourses, evil, security, peril, are the ones that have been foundational to the Bush administration's war on terrorism. To run for president, as John Kerry has, is to try to challenge those, to try to fit within those, to try to work within those. Newspaper editorials, of which I said examined more than 300 in the aftermath, I forgot to mention to you, in the aftermath of each of the speeches. So the two days following each address, examine these editorials across these newspapers. 326 editorials consistently echoing those messages of the administration. Now is this because they're pro-Bush? No, I don't think it's because they're pro-Bush. I don't think it's because they're, I don't, think, I don't accept the anti-Bush argument either. I think it's because journalists like good news stories. And evil, security and peril makes good news stories. And a sophisticated political machinery, the White House, knows this. So why does this matter? It matters because this ability to parse the world into binaries, to speak as if you know in the heart of everybody that you're evil and you're good. And if we take you out, we'll be secure. But if we leave you, we'll, we'll be okay too. That ability to speak is what I consider to be the great superpower privilege. To demarcate the world in ways that work to your advantage and that you can then operate on that world to your advantage. It's a position in which for Americans feels fairly comfortable. Aren't we just calling evil evil? Isn't that evil? But to make those kind of claims by anybody is experienced globally not as somebody just making those claims. It's experienced as arrogance. It's experienced as who are you to tell me who I am and what should be done. That arrogance by this administration, grounded in a religious context, I think has done more to push nations away from the United States than any other entity of the Bush administration. They are troubled deeply by this either you're with us or against us policy. This is one characteristic. Characteristic two is an obsession with time. There is a belief among fundamentalists that human history could end at essentially any moment. This belief infuses ideas and behaviors with an urgency. Tom DeLay, for example, in the House of Representatives, a conservative Christian from Texas. I gave a talk at, uh, at Texas last week, and I was using this example, and I thought for a moment, should I use this Tom DeLay example while I'm here in Austin? It went okay in Austin. I'm not sure the rest of the state. But DeLay has a plaque in his office when you walk in that says, today could be the day. 
and it's a reference to today could be the day that Jesus returns, okay? Now, I'm not here to be critical of the religious worldview. I'm a person of religious faith myself. My issue is how it's taken to an extreme by this administration, okay? What has happened with this administration is that they privilege action over reflection and debate. Action is privileged over reflection and debate. This is not an administration that's interested in talking about things. They're interested in acting. This action imperative is joined by resolve when people see themselves as part of God's plan. A Bush administration clearly sees themselves as part of God's plan. Bush talks about it regularly. So much regularly that this word resolve is one of George Bush's favorite words. He's resolved, he's resolute, he'll stick to the, stick to the policies in Iraq. I believe this need to act, this desire to act, and this is an administration that clearly acts, and the sense of resolution is deeply tied to this kind of sense of that uh, we're running out of time. We need to act right now. For the administration, it clearly becomes political fundamentalism when the administration pushes, that's the word over there, when the administration pushes for imminent action and then res and is res resolved, but it only does this on its policies. They push for imminent action, the need for speed, the need to act now, and then resolution, on, but it's on their policies. They don't do this when the Democrats suggest certain things. This is when they suggest certain things. For example, the Department of Homeland Security was proposed after 9-11 by Democrats in the Senate. It was an idea that actually had a history before this, talked about by former senators. The Bush administration wanted nothing to do with this after September 11th, and so they squelched it, and in that time of great political capital for the president, they were able to kind of silence that message. But shortly thereafter, the president decided that they were interested in this, this idea, the Department of Homeland Security. So rather than bring it back up to Congress and ask us to have a conversation about it as a nation, or at least among its political leaders, that's not what this administration did. Instead, they convened a group of five to six people in the White House who worked in top secret on creating a new Department of Homeland Security, the largest reorganization of the federal government since the Defense Department was created after World War II. They didn't talk to anybody outside of those five or six people for months and created this new structure. Then on June 5th, 2002, they told people in Congress of their plan, and on June 6th, they told the news media, and that evening the president gave a national address in which he announced this plan. And then they pushed for imminent action. We need to act on it now. I would have no problem, or at least not as much of a problem, if they pushed for action, if they first were willing to talk to people about this process. So I just want to show you a little bit of data on this. The discourses of what I call time urgency, which is an explicit statement that we need to act, and calls for Congress to act, the, the statement that we need to act on this quickly. I'm just going to show you this language for the Patriot Act, but you can see similar language for the other policies I've looked at. And on the graph I'm about to show you, there'll be five uh, sets to this. On the far left will be John Ashcroft's emphases, and then Bush's, and then three for the news media. This is how much they emphasize this in all of their communications about the Patriot Act. <clears throat> Here's John Ashcroft. Calls for Congress to act in time urgency, both of them present in more than 80% of his communications about the Patriot Act. For George Bush, calls for Congress to act are present in two-thirds of their communications about the Patriot Act. Time urgency, not as much. So why is that? Why is he not as explicitly stating that, we're run, that we are, have limited time, that we really need to act right now? I think it's because it's right after 9-11, that this is a president that if he stood up right after 9-11 and said, we have limited time, it would have hurt them, because it would have showed uh, him in not a great position of leadership, saying, you know, we have to act, he's, he's, he's worried, he's anxious. It wouldn't have been the most leadership-oriented position. But more importantly, I think it would have emphasized that they did have time to act. And that time to act was the nine months before 9-11, when they had been told about the urgent threat that was terrorism. So the fact that the president doesn't emphasize it suggests to me that it's a strategic move. I'm further convinced of this because when I look at the Department of Homeland Security discussion, which happens several months later, and I look at Iraq, which happens months after that, this emphasis upon time urgency, the need to act right now, goes way up for the president as we move farther away from 9-11. Either case, they're emphasizing the need to act right now. In the paper yesterday, I opened it up and the president said, we want a bill on our desk as fast as possible for the 9-11 recommendations. But first they rejected those. Now they want them. And so it's imminent action. We need to act as soon as possible. 
These three right over here are news media. This is news coverage. Generally in newspapers, these are editorials and television coverage. In all three instances, we see either a quarter to more than half of news stories analyzed echoing these messages. This is political fundamentalism, the merger of a conservative religious worldview with a political agenda that works to their advantage. <clears throat> Why does this matter? It matters because the administration isn't interested in talking to people, they're interested in acting. I want to read you a quote from Ron Suskin's New York Times piece this past Sunday, in which he talked about the Bush administration. And it's right on point to this idea of action. This is Ron Suskin, who's written about the, from the insides of the Bush administration, quoting people there. I want to read you one paragraph in which Suskin is talking to an aide in the White House, somebody in the White House. So Suskin's writing in the first person. So when he refers to me, he's talking about himself, Suskin. The aide said that guys like me, Suskin, were, quote, in what we call the reality-based community which he defined the aid as people who believe that solutions emerge from, you, from your judicious study of discernible reality. I nodded and murmured something about enlightenment principles and empiricism. I agreed with him. He cut me off. The aid said, that's not the way the world really works anymore. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously, as you will, we'll act again creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors. And you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. They're going to act. They have acted. The issue is that they act unilaterally in this process. Characteristic three, a universal gospel of freedom and liberty. The Christian theology has the good news. The good news is the gospel in the Christian theology. Well, the Bush administration has the good news, too, and it's the gospel of freedom and liberty. Among fundamentalists, they, they hold the beliefs and they act in certain ways in which they are thought to, they, there is the perspective that their beliefs and behaviors are thought to provide mandated universal norms for everybody. The ways that fundamentalists see in the world are thought to be the way that we all should see the world. After 9-11, the president regularly talked about freedom and liberty as universal norms or God's wishes for all people. Now, theologically, I don't have a tremendous problem with the president saying that a higher power, God, wants freedom and liberty for people. Because if you, if you believe in a higher power, then I'd like to think that that higher power wants freedom and liberty, not slavery or something, okay? So I'm willing to theologically accept that. But the problem is that what the president really means when he says this is that God wants U.S. style freedom and liberty for the world. And so the Bush administration has consistently linked American policies that they declare are for about freedom and liberty with what God wants. In the third presidential debate, George W. Bush said this, I believe that God wants everybody to be free. So there's the claim. That's what I believe. And that's one part of my foreign policy. In Afghanistan, I believe that the freedom there is a gift from the Almighty. And I can't tell you how encouraged I am to see freedom on the march. Freedom on the march is a clear reference to Iraq. That's how he talks about Iraq regularly. What he has suggested quite clearly is that God wants freedom and liberty. We're pursuing freedom and liberty. Thus, God wants our policies. It's implied, could never be said explicitly, I went on Fox News and made my argument, and they said, where has the president ever said this? I said, well, he hasn't quite said that, and that's where you lose the debate on Fox News right there, okay? If you don't have the smoking gun, in that context, you're in trouble. So to make this suggestion that it's implied and that's every bit as dangerous, that's what my point is. My concern doesn't hold there, but I'm hopeful it'll hold here, or at least we'll be able to think about how that implication is very important. Bush is suggesting that God wants U.S.-style freedom and liberty for all. Scott Appleby, who's a theologian at Notre Dame, has called this a theological version of manifest destiny, in which the administration has taken the idea of manifest destiny and put it into theological terms, updated for the war on terrorism. So what about freedom and liberty discourse? Is it that present in this administration? Is it all over the place? Is it the universal gospel that I say it is? So I coded for freedom and liberty words. It's a very conservative coding, not politically, just in terms of finding this. 
I actually quoted merely for the words of freedom and liberty. Were they present in the president's national addresses? And how present were they? And then I looked at the editorials for the two days afterwards, the same 20 newspapers. And you can see this. On the left will be the president's words, and on the right will be editorials, broken into three time periods. Here is Bush before 9-11, in which freedom and liberty words are present in one of every 10 paragraphs for him in his addresses. After 9-11, it's in one of every five paragraphs. And around Iraq, the Iraq War, the three, the three addresses in my analysis that bracket the Iraq War, he talks about freedom and liberty in one of every three paragraphs in his national addresses. It is the freedom and liberty language in which he then comes along and occasionally issues his declarations of what God wants. And here we see the editorials again moving in lockstep with the administration, the press echoing this. This is political fundamentalism. Why does it matter? <clears throat> it matters because the administration has combined Bush's statement of you're either with us or against us with declarations about God wanting freedom and liberty. And what that means is that the administration has transformed the you're either with us or against us position to you're either with us or against God. It's what they've suggested. That's anti-democratic. It's hostile to democracy. It's hostile to open debate. Final characteristic, an intolerance of dissent. <clears throat> The co a core tenet of fundamentalism is that wisdom and authority are to be viewed in hierarchical terms. Quite simply, leaders are not to be challenged. Wisdom is thought to come from on high to religious leaders, but also perhaps to political leaders. And this is an administration which does not kindly cha uh, tolerate challenges to its leadership. They do two things in particular I want to suggest. First of all, in their political fundamentalism, they emphasize unity as a normative expectation. This administration consistently talks about unity as a valuable, very important piece of the American political scene. I probably could accept that, except what the administration really means is that we have a position and we think all of you should be unified behind our position. Because they consistently talk about unity after they've launched a plan. If we all came together and figured out the plan, then maybe unity would be appropriate but not when you start to impose it as a norm upon people. But this doesn't always work. We know norms don't always work. So you have to come behind it with the hammer. And the hammer is to make people pay a price if they disagree with you. Those who publicly challenge you must pay a price. And the administration makes people pay a price. And that price is twofold. One, you're declared to be unpatriotic if you disagree with the administration. And two, you're declared to be a threat to the nation. And this administration has done this consistently, whether it's Richard Clark, Paul O'Neill, Joseph Wilson, John Kerry, John Edwards. Consistently happens. Let me show you some of the presence of political unity language by this administration across three different, three different policies. On the far left will be the Patriot Act, in the middle will be Homeland Security, and on the far right will be Iraq. This is the emphasis upon unity in this administration's language. Here's Ashcroft and Bush. An emphasis upon unity in 75 to 80 percent of their communications. Here's Bush, 90 percent of his communications about Homeland Security. Here's Bush, Powell, Rumsfeld. Bush again about 90 percent. Powell and Rumsfeld not quite as high because they actually have to deal with people. Uh, so they're not quite as high. But right there. And look at the president. Is he nothing, he's nothing if not consistent, right? About 90% unity. The people working with me on, these, on this analysis, after about reading 10 of them, you could pretty much read most, you knew most of them what was coming, where it was coming. He would talk about unity, and he would talk about the war on terrorism, and so on. I want to be very clear. In all three of these instances, the Patriot Act, the discussion of the Department of Homeland Security, and the push for Iraq, in all three instances, the administration publicly announced the policy it wanted, and then talked about unity in all three instances, OK? But it only works, as I said, if you make people pay a price, or at least some people pay a price if they challenge you. And this is an administration which has done this consistently. I just want to show you one instance in December 2001. John Ashcroft came to the US Senate in December 2001. They asked him to come to speak about two things, the military tribunals that the president had issued um, had created by executive order, and the treatment of civil liberties and civil rights by 
the treatment by the government of people of Middle Eastern descent and South Asian descent. Wanted to see them, wanted to answer, the uh, Senate wanted to talk to him about this from the administration. Ashcroft, just before Ashcroft came to the Senate, there was some very low level criticism of him. Very low level, but still it caught his attention. And for an administration that doesn't tolerate dissent, they weren't going to stand for it. So in his address to the Senate, in his opening remarks, he talked about some of these criticisms, and then he said this. <clears throat> we need honest, reasoned debate, not fear-mongering. To those who pit Americans against immigrants and citizens against non-citizens, to those who scare peace-loving people with phantoms of lost liberty, my message is this. Your tactics only aid terrorists, for they erode our national unity and diminish our resolve. They give ammunition to America's enemies and pause to America's friends. John Ashcroft. The word fear-mongering deserves a mention. It's a common word. It's a word, a cocktail party word. It's a, it's a word I use with my students in my classes all the time, anytime they challenge me. I say, I say you are a fear-monger, okay? <laughs> it encourages discussion. It's a word that has a history in the American political scene. The last time it was used in American politics was in the 1950s, when Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower said, Joseph McCarthy, you are a fearmonger. What Ashcroft has done in this address is equate critics of the administration with Joseph McCarthy and say, you are stirring up trouble irresponsibly. You are a fearmonger. The press loves this. The media love it when the, uh, these kinds of things happen, it makes for good news stories, gets trumpeted, gets emphasized. And to be very clear, here the press is quite critical of the administration. The press is not, does not like this. But the administration doesn't, is not concerned about that criticism because the message that you don't cross the administration goes out widely in the press. So yes, they're criticized, but people receive the message. You cross us, you'll pay a price. The administration will happily tolerate some criticism in order to get that message out. They'll take the echo, they'll, they'll take the criticism in order to have the echo. <clears throat> Four things to conclude with. First of all, the discourses of the Bush administration are similar to those that it fights. When I began to do this work, this is not a conclusion I would have expected to arrive at. This, there's no anti-Bush position that has driven this research, none whatsoever. I come out of this research quite critical of the Bush administration, driven by the evidence that I see here. I see it as hostile to democracy. Binaries, talking about the world in limited ways, an obsession with time, saying we have to act immediately without debate, claims about universal norms that I hold and you should have, claims that those are what God wants, and an intolerance of dissent. I have a hard time distinguishing those when Bush is saying it or when Osama bin Laden is saying it. Those are similar discourses. I would expect something better from the President of the United States and from this administration. Second, it is a reality that democracy is always at risk when the press abdicates its responsibility for monitoring the government. I can accept that the media might be liberal and sometimes conservative others. My analysis suggests that the press has overwhelmingly echoed the administration in these 20 months that I looked at. When the press does that, when they are such, so deferential to the American uh, governmental leadership, they abdicate their role as a check on that leadership to ways that hurt us. I'm pleased that in the aftermath of their poor coverage of, weapon, of weapons of mass destruction, that news organizations have apologized for this. The New York Times has, the Washington Post has. I'm pleased that they're willing to acknowledge making mistakes. As a journalist, of course I made mistakes. As a professor of journalism, I talk about my students about the importance of recognizing that journalists aren't perfect. I'm pleased that the press is willing to acknowledge this. I'm disappointed that the press had to acknowledge this. They deferred to political leadership in ways that, even if Bush is not elected, reelected, will have long-term effects for America and the globe. Third, there is a fusion of politics and faith in this administration, and I think a fusion of politics and faith ultimately hurts both, to the detriment of both. When political leaders 
align themselves with a religious viewpoint or take it on for their political gain, they're unable to do the things that we need from political leaders, such as compromise, such as engage in open democratic discussion and debate. They're not willing to do that in the same way because they are tied to a view of, uh, of, of an absolute view of the world that is, is hostile to that kind of democracy. I think that's unfortunate. From the faith side of things, to align with any pol particular political group puts, your, puts the, face, the face of that group on your faith. George Bush is seen as the face of Christianity outside America today. He is seen as the face of that. And I don't understand why, it, why religious conservatives would want that face. Any face, not just Bush's, any face because the faith gets distorted when it enters the political realm, because it gets used for political purposes. Ultimately, this works to the detriment of all of us, whether you're a person of faith or not. And finally, fear must be replaced by hope in the American political system, or we're, we're in deep, deep trouble. In 1941, Franklin Roosevelt addressed the nation, and he said, all we have to fear is fear itself. Today, all we have is fear itself. And it drives our politics. It sustains the crisis context. It has prompted a fusion of religion and politics that I think serves none of us well, even the people that hold that faith substantively. Whether it's Bush or Kerry, whoever it is, in eight days from now or three months from now, because that's how long it might take, we need to have a conversation about this that moves beyond where we've been for the last three or four years for the good of all of us. Thank you for having me tonight. At this point in time, if we want to do any question and answer, Please tell me first if it's going to be a tough question. Sure. Uh, so your, que your question is, why, why do I suggest the press needs to play some role here as opposed to other political leaders challenging the languages of the administration or any political fundamentalist? Actually, I, I, I do suggest in my book about the importance of other political leaders doing it too. But in the absence of them doing that, which clearly happened after 9-11, it wasn't challenged, that the press nonetheless still has the responsibility to, to scrutinize the way faith plays a role in any administration. Um, and the, so for the press to be, to wait for other political leaders to do this, I certainly want other political leaders to do it also. But for the press to wait for that is for the press to remove the role that I believe it's supposed to play in the American political system, to, suit, to serve as its own checks, on, checks and balance on government leadership, not just to rely upon other political leaders to do that. Because then essentially they simply serve other powerful people too. So if the press abdicates that entire role to merely another political leader, then the press is simply saying that it has no independent role in the American political system. And I don't believe that, the, that that's the conception of, of the press that will benefit us or that has served us well in the past. I believe we need an independent press that certainly listens to political leadership, certainly gives them voice, but doesn't merely echo them without thoughtfully thinking about other voices that could be present or scrutinizing those messages that they are giving voice to. Okay. Before political health returns. <clears throat> So the first question is, do I see more of what I've advocate, uh, advocated? Do I see some of that happening? I do see some of that happening. In the last month and a half of this campaign, 
I think there's been more written about religion and politics than in it, maybe two decades, the last two decades, because so much attention has been given to the Bush administration's religious faith. As people write books, there's DVDs that have come out, there's uh, films that have been out there, there's Carrie has become, back to your point, Carrie has begun to talk about this and to challenge the administration's rhetoric. So I think the press is beginning to move to a new, I think a threshold has been crossed in which the press now says, our model of covering religion is failing us because we're not being able to scrutinize it. I believe that claims about religion made by political leaders and the ways in which religion plays out in, po in politics is one of the last great areas that politicians are really go unchallenged on right now. I think that needs to change. The exact model by which that can happen, I don't, I don't know for sure. Because we're talking about things that aren't empirically verifiable here. How does it happen? I'm not sure. However, people like Diane Winston and our focus on media and religion in this country are having these conversations because we, journalists, if journalists are going to ignore religion, which they've essentially done, political journalists have essentially done for decades now because they saw religion as a minor part of American politics, that's just not so anymore. And so that cannot continue if we're going to have uh, politi political health. Because even if Bush is, is not, does not win, uh, John Kerry and the role of religion in American politics and the role of religion globally is so um, intensified now that it's going to remain important. So I think the press is beginning to take some important steps. And part of that's been spurred by, by the candidates. Part of it's been spurred by outside actors. And part of it's been spurred, uh, just journalists themselves taking it upon themselves. Um, I think we need a lot more of that. I think it's crucial for our democracy, um, for, for when politicians make claims about religion or any religiously based uh, arguments, that, that those are scrutinized in the same way that their claims are about health care or about Iraq. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Right. So the question is, how much of what I'm arguing might be attributable to purely religious motives and what might be attributable to strategy? I mean, could, could you go so far as to make the entire argument that it's only strategy as opposed to genuinely religious in any way? Yeah. Yeah, and then are there certain people in this administration or more, glo or more generally in American politics that it's, cert that it's more genuinely religious? Actually, I, I have spent a lot of time thinking about that question. Because when I wrote this book, I do, I do not scrutinize or do not interrogate George Bush's faith in this book. I don't go in and analyze whether I think it's real or f falsified. I simply take it on faith that it's genuine, essentially. I, I simply say, this is what he says, and so I'm going to take it as it is. So when I wrote the book and had it read by other people, some people disagreed with me and said, you have to at least consider that this is all fake. Okay, and so a year later, I'm entertaining that notion that it's purely strategic and that's it. Because I've, been ta I've talked to several people um, who have suggested to me that George Bush has utilized, ha have helped me to see how, how much George Bush has utilized faith in his toughest political moments and doesn't use it in those moments where he's sailing along just fine. So if you look at the God language for this administration, it's most present in regard to Iraq, to issues of freedom and liberty, where they've been challenged the most. He doesn't utilize it when he talks about the issues that are crucial to the conservative base, abortion or uh, gay rights or gay marriage or those issues, stem cell. He doesn't talk about God there at all. So he uses it to his advantage. Further, other people have argued that, uh, have, have suggested to me that he's never taken a political stand in which he's taken a stand based upon his faith that is conflicted with any kind of partisan gain. Never. So those things begin to build up, and I begin to wonder. So when I wrote the book, I was probably 75% certain it was all genuine on Bush's part, 25% wondering. The rest of the administration, I don't spend as much time thinking about because I think it kind of just fuses down to them, although I think Ashcroft is quite genuine for. 
Um, so Ashcroft's a true, a true believer. I have no doubt about that. Um, so, so I said it was 75%. Today, I think I'm more about 25% certain that this is genuine and 75% thinking it might be mostly political strategy. Either way, it's a question that ultimately doesn't drive me as a scholar because the American public thinks it's genuine. And that's what, in, that's what intrigues me the most. We'll go here and then here, here, and here. Yeah, it, it definitely, uh, the narratives that go with the binaries or the gospel of freedom and liberty, those are powerful claims that, that weren't created by this administration by any means. Um, they tap into Cold War ideas way back, go way back. That's what makes it so politically powerful and allows the administration, whether it's genuinely religious or not, to declare that it's not, relig that it's not religious. And they consistently claim that it's, his policies are not religiously grounded although they've begun to move a little bit away from that with freedom and liberty. I think that the context might have driven anybody to, that, to this kind of narrative initially after 9-11. I'm willing to accept that. Um, and certainly politically, in terms of rhetoric and good news stories, binaries are effective. But I do believe that the American public um, and certainly the white evangelical Protestants, Bush's base that are very important, politically, um, do experience this in, re in a religious way that's different, it, it, the, the base does, in a way that's seen as religious, as opposed to just merely, um, merely just a statement uh, about the kind of political moment of the time. This is good versus evil. This is, as Pat Robertson said just two days ago, this is c Christianity versus Islam for the, the, the final end times battle in Israel. Okay, that's what this is. And uh, that imbuing of the religious piece, because Bush himself has this kind of use of God language and the whole narrative about Bush's biography, I think has moved these binaries and other strategic elements beyond being experienced by the public as merely political. So even if it is nothing but political in creation, its experience when you combine that with other Bush language and the context that we're in, that it's become this kind of fusion of religion and politics that's different than what we had before. Maybe it's close to what we had in the Cold War, in the height of the Cold War in the 1950s, and when Eisenhower um, and the Congress put one nation under God in the, dec in the, uh, the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and put one God we trust on, on money. But there, we're focusing on the godless communism, and now, that was the claim, and now we're focusing on the, the, the threat from extremist Islam. And so it taps into even deeper kind of religious battle pieces that I think. So ultimately, the motivation for this will always remain a black box to me. But I, when I look at public opinion data, people consistently talk about this president as a man of God, as a person of God. And I hear that claim all over the place from people who I really respect. And the only reason they're getting this is because of the language the Bush administration has put forward and because so many people kind of make this argument. So the language fits into this nicer, grander narrative that works for them, I believe. Three hundred, four hundred thousand a day. Yeah. I 
disagree with you. Yeah, you're right. Um, <clears throat> two reasons you don't hear in my talk. One, I'm human, so I couldn't do all of that analysis of the blogs. Uh, and second, I think blogs as a mainstream political ph phenomenon have reached a tipping point now where they're moving into a broader set of kind of read by many Americans. But I have a graduate student who's, who's doing a work on blogs right now. And uh, most recent data, early 2004, blogs are read by 7% of Americans. So several hundred thousand is still a very small number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, in, in my analysis with 20 newspapers, three broadcast networks, I find them to be quite similar. It's part of the news discourse generally. I also analyze news coverage. I analyze hundreds of news stories, hundreds of editorials, hundreds of television news stories. Consistently across all of those three forms of news coverage, the message gets echoed. The administration message gets echoed. I, I can see I'm not going to persuade you on this point here. <laughs> I'm with you there, but I do defer to what the public tells me, and the public tells not me specifically, but tells pollsters and uh, uh, kind of consistent basis that two-thirds of Americans get their news primarily from television. Fifty percent of Americans get their news first and foremost from cable television. And so the Internet is important, but the Internet is to the left like the talk radio is to the right, generally. It reaches and activates, I believe, a group of people that are networked among each other. I don't think it reaches the mainstream of Americans so far, but I'm getting more and more interested because I think it's moving that way. The first question is, have I done any work on this? I, I talked at lunch today to some people, too, in which I talked about white Catholics and white evangelical Protestants and their support for the Bush administration. And so your question, the first question is, have I done any research on how different communities of color might have been responding to this? Uh, no, but I can speak to having heard someone talk about, um, <clears throat> uh, who's a scholar, an expert on the African-American kind of church. And, and she talks about, she has talked about in this campaign how African Americans have been troubled, uh, have been torn because they, uh, African Americans are some of the most highly religious individuals in our country. And when you look at evangelical Protestants, African Americans make up a decent number of those in this country. Um, but yet they align democratically predominantly. And she talked about how the, the African Americans in this election have been troubled because they, they found Bush's faith claims to be resonant. And, uh, but yet the policies just don't, they don't ag agree with them. This is what the scholar was saying. Um, so I haven't done any work on that particularly, but I do know related to that point that right now John Kerry's support among African American, uh, I should say this the other way around, George Bush's support among black voters in this country is at about 12 to 14 percent, which is early in this campaign, for up through early August, that support was at 6 percent. So it has, I think he's made some significant inroads there. Um, but that's not my analysis. The second point you had asked about was uh, other candidates. I think it's definitely affecting other candidates. There's nothing that uh, political, things that work politically get replicated. And it's going to get replicated both because it works politically and also because the religious right in this country is no longer a force that's moving up. They are ascendant as a force. They gained a power in 1994 with the Christian Coalition's support of the House of Representatives uh, take over by Republicans. And now with George Bush, they have the presidency and uh, as well as the House. <clears throat> That's, that means that as a political force, they're very important. It also means that conservatives and liberals will take them into account when they think about things. 
So Richard Land, who's the head of the Liberty and Ethics, I believe, division of the Southern Baptist Convention, and has been a consultant for the Bush administration throughout its administration, said recently in the New York Times that, yes, we want Bush to win. Yes, we're working to have Bush win. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter because the next candidate will look just like this. Yeah. I think that's an interesting place to end. <laughs> and I want to thank David. I will, sure. Thank you. Thank you.